I'd now like to welcome to the stage uh, Irving Ladowski Berger, who's going to uh, attempt to moderate <laughs> something that may be beyond uh, the capabilities of our, our equipment today, which is a, a dual Skype conversation with the two panelists on Skype. Irving. Thank you, Jim, and it's a pleasure to be here. And when Jim and I discussed my participating in this incredibly interesting conference uh, to talk about technology and the future of jobs, I said that I would be happy to do that, but I would be even happier if I can have with me one of the top labor economists in the country and one of the top technology reporters in the country, and I happen to know them both. And Jim said, that's okay. And so I invited David Otor, who hopefully uh, will appear on Skype shortly, and John Marco, who will also hopefully appear on Skype shortly, to be here with me. So, uh, Assuming all the audiovisual is working, uh, you know, I'll keep talking and hopefully David and John will appear as appropriate. But uh, let me start by giving some uh, initial remarks. So when we look at technology and the future of jobs, one of the ways I like to understand the future is by looking at what has happened through history. Since the future is unpredictable, let's at least see what has happened through time. And one of the people who's written the most about technology revolution through history is a Venezuelan economist, Carlota Perez, whom I like a lot. She's Venezuelan, she's very smart. She comes from Latin America like me. And uh, by the way, Jim, it's okay to be an immigrant who speaks Spanish so far. And um, Carlota Perez, who is at the University of Sussex, has identified that in the last 200 some years, we've had five major technology based revolutions. First is the steam power machines and factories in the late 18th century, 1770s, whatever. Then came the age of iron and railroad in the early part of the 19th century. The latter part of the 19th century had incredible technologies between steel, electricity, the telephone, and so on. And then in the early part of the 20th century, we got cars, we got the oil and petroleum industry, we got airplanes, and so on. In each one of these major revolutions, people ask themselves the same questions we're asking ourselves today. What will happen to jobs? And a number of our speakers have talked about John Maynard Keynes, who wrote about technology unemployment in 1930, that in 100 years from then, we would be working 15 hours a week, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, it's hard. Some people said maybe we're only working 15 hours a week, but it hasn't quite worked out that way. And so far, I think the way things have worked out is that while there has been a huge amount of pain in the transition, and while often a generation of workers has been left behind, over time, society and economies have adjusted. That's been the case so far. Then comes the fifth revolution that, the, that Carlota Perez wrote about, which is our IT and digital revolution that started in the latter part of the 20th century. And the question that I have in my mind 
and I don't know the answer, is whether this is the fifth revolution that we've seen throughout the industrial age, or perhaps this digital revolution is something new in the same way that when we transition from being hunter-gatherers to agriculture 8,000 years ago or so, there was something new. And when we transition from the agricultural and feudal age to the industrial age, that was something new. Is it possible that this is really different because we're now applying technology and machines to cognitive, uh, to intelligence, to all kinds of new capabilities. We don't know the answer whether once more it's going to be very painful for decades. Remember, a generation being left behind is not five years. It could be 10, 20, 30 years. But over time, society adapts. And we've heard a lot of different points of views as to whether that will happen or not. Before getting David, who will hopefully show up on the screen in a second, let me just sort of paint a very positive scene for the future and a very negative scene for the future. So from the point of view of technology, one of the most positive things I can think of is that a number of people looking at the future from McKinsey Global Institute to National Intelligence Councils have said that one of the biggest things that will happen is that about three billion people around the world will see their standard of living rising as a result of being included in the digital economy. First of all, as Papa Francisco reminded us, it is good to see people's standard of living going up, even if you just don't think of money. It is better to have people live better lives. But if you also want to be a good market capitalist, which I consider myself, all these people with extra income will become consumers. And maybe that will be one of the engines powering the economy in this 21st century that we cannot even begin to think of, but that may be the direction China and India and even Africa over time will go. That's one possibility. The other possibility is that we'll have what people call the singularity and the cloud robotics and existential threats to humankind and we'll wake up one day and super intelligent sentient machines will take over and we'll figure out what the hell do we do. And where in this spectrum we are, I don't know the answer, but it will be interesting to discuss it with my very eminent panelists. Now, hopefully, David is there. David, are you there? Can you, is David Otor there? Oh, I see John Markov and I see Dave. David, can you hear me? I can hear you great, Irving. Great. So David, let me ask you a question. I don't know if you heard my introduction. I did. And I hope you both heard that the reason I invited you is because I happen to know one of the country's top labor economies, namely you, and one of the country's top technology reporters and writers, namely you, John. So let me start with David. So David, you just wrote this really good article, which I actually know a lot about because I finished writing a blog about it. Why are there still so many jobs, the history and future of workplace automation, in which you summarize the way you saw the future. Can you essentially tell us how you see this by telling us a bit about this article? 
Uh, sure, uh, my pleasure to do so. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, the, the article that you're describing uh, is called uh, Why Are There Still So Many Jobs? And the reason I uh, adopt that somewhat provocative title is that we could have been having this conversation 200 years ago or 100 years ago or even 50 years ago, and many people did, about the coming demise of employment due to marvelous advances in technology, for which we've ex been experiencing for 200 years. And uh, we could have asked in 1900, when 40% of US employment was on, in agriculture on farms, uh, what will we do when only 2% of employment is in agriculture on farms? Uh, what will the other 38% of people do? And it would have been a very difficult question to answer because we would not have anticipated uh, you know, that we would have been doing healthcare and software and business services and tourism and travel and all the many, many things that we do so the question is, why hasn't, why hasn't technology displaced us? And I think there are five reasons. Uh, I'll try to be very straightforward. They're, they're not complicated reasons. First is that we underestimate actually how marvelous we really are, uh, how hard we are to replace, how flexible, ingenious, uh, and adaptable. Uh, and we do many, many things. Uh, our machines are certainly becoming more marvelous all the time, but they don't approach us at this point in terms of their flexibility, their common sense, their creativity, their ability to solve new problems and adapt to unfamiliar situations. Second, we neglect how machines complement us and make us more valuable. Uh, there's a long history of thinking that there's a finite amount of work to do, so when machines do more, people do less, but that's not true. We do different work as we mechanize, and generally we do more valuable work. If I'm an architect and I can have all my drafting done electronically and the calculations on my buildings done more rapidly, that doesn't make me less valuable. That makes me more valuable. It complements my labor because I'm supplying to something uh, the machine can't do, but it's necessary to get the job done. And so as I offload more of the repetitive and even demanding tasks onto uh, inexpensive hardware, the piece that I supply that is not done by the machine becomes more valuable. Third, we underestimate our own creativity. When people make a bold forecast, this time is different. We won't be able to think of anything new to do like we did in the past that will demand so much labor. That's a very bold and presumptuous bet against humanity, against human creativity. I would never be so bold to say, not only can I not think of that thing, but I'm 100% sure that none of you we'll think of anything either. We're just gonna be out of ideas. That's crazy. <laughs> uh, fourth, uh, we forget about unlimited wants. We forget about the fact that as people get wealthier, they want to buy and consume more stuff. If people in 2015 were happy to live at the standard of living that they did in 1950, they could work about 20 to 25 hours a week. People could work much less and enjoy a 1950 standard of living because we're so much more productive. But people don't choose to do that. They choose to work more because there are so many good things to do with those resources, uh, so many uh, opportunities for, uh, you know, for expenditure. And of course, work itself is rewarding and work gets more interesting in general as we mechanize the more routine or the rote parts of it. Um, finally, uh, we tend to forget that the machines work for us. We don't work for the machines. If it really is the case that 50 or 100 years from now, we can enjoy exactly the same standard of living without doing any work by having computers or robots do all our work. Well, then we're fabulously wealthy. Uh, and the problem we face in that case is a problem of income distribution. It's a problem of figuring out how to dis distribute that surplus. It's certainly not a bad problem to have, a problem of having eliminated all scarcity. Now, I frankly don't think we're going to get there anytime soon. There is no evidence that we are approaching the singularity or anything like it. If you look at the growth rate of productivity, if you look at the type of the investment patterns we're seeing, we're getting a lot better at a narrow set of things quickly. But we are in no sense supplanting ourselves or outgrowing our own capacity to consume uh, or accelerating even in our rate of productivity growth. So I think we should be uh, pleased and optimistic that we're creating marvelous technologies that will uh, enhance both our work and our leisure. The challenge that we face is one of income distribution. And of course, it's not about the quantity of jobs, but about the quality of jobs. Obviously, there can be worse and better jobs. Uh, automation makes mentally demanding jobs more interesting. It sometimes makes rote jobs, like uh, cleaning and food service and so on, 
more abundant, and that's a negative. So I'm not worried about the loss of employment per se. I'm worried about the challenge of uh, distribution of wealth and the challenge of making sure that people, most people, have the opportunity to benefit from the technology. It's going to create a lot of gross wealth, uh, I mean, increase in wealth, but that doesn't mean uh, the way it's shared will necessarily be one that we're happy about. Okay, well, thank you, that. David. And uh, John, can you hear me okay? Yes, yeah, Serving, I can hear you. Okay, so John, um, you've been writing a lot about AI, artificial intelligence, and in fact, you're on book tour for Machines of Loving Grace, am I correct? That's correct, endless. Endless book, okay. Well, that's great that you have a new book that you are on book tour on. And, uh, you know, and one of the questions that has been interesting is, you know, will machines become so advanced, AI, that we'll get, if not sort of the rapturous singularity, something close to it, and I read about cloud robotics from actually one of the other articles in the same issue as David's. And what's so interesting, John, is that I've been reading a lot about what you write about all this in the New York Times and elsewhere, and you just covered for the New York Times the DARPA robotics uh, contest. And so you had some very interesting to say about the state of the art of robotics based on your coverage. So where do you think we are with increasingly intelligent machines sort of taking over? And by taking over, I mean there'll be fewer and fewer jobs for people. So uh, let me first say that I'm partly to blame for the current phase of technological anxiety. I began to write about the impact of new automation technologies on the white collar workforce a half decade ago. And I have to say that I've come to a much more nuanced view of things than I had initially, partially from reading people like David and partially from talking to other economists. Uh, let me start with a cautionary tale. Um, in 1995, Jeremy Rifkin published The End of Work. Um, in the following uh, decade, employment in the U.S. went from 115 million to 137 million, 19 percent compare, uh, growth compared to population growth of 11 million. So timing is everything. Um, and, you know, this particular time is just a dream for a reporter. Um, we have a tremendous diversity of opinion. Uh, on the one side, we have the International Federation of Robots that argues that robotics will create the greatest job renaissance in history. And on the other side, we have uh, Silicon Valley technologists who like to argue that machines will be able to do, replace all human work by uh, 2045, and obviously they can't both be uh, right. And I, I basically come to feel more skeptical about predictions of imminent stru structural changes, uh, displacement of skilled work, and, and, you know, the AI field, I'm sorry to say, has been over-optimistic, uh, has over-promised and under-delivered going all the way back to 1956. Um, Perhaps it's a, an artifact of science fiction. I don't know what it is. But the fact is that now 140 million people are working in the United States more than ever in history. Um, people, when I tell them that, say, yes, but labor force participation is declining. Um, and, uh, you know, I, as I've begun to try to pick that apart, it seems to me that there are other factors besides technology, um, particularly my own cohort, uh, baby boomers, who are now moving through the workforce. I was just at my college reunion. I'm 65. And I was one of the few people who still has a job. Uh, somehow I didn't get the memo. Um, uh, so, um, you know, uh, what I've come to, the, to, to sort of see in this, uh, this period, particularly in the developed world, that actually um, I now believe that demographic changes will be more important than technological changes in shaping what happens to the workforce over the next uh, decade or two. Um, you know, we're about to hit this point in the world. Uh, by 2020, I believe that m more people for the first time in history will be over 65 than under, under 5, and the, the dependency ratio is going to be a really interesting thing. And so when I look at, to get to your point about um, the robotics challenge, um, the most important metric to me is when will we have a robotic system that is capable of safely assisting an aging human in taking a shower? 
And uh, from uh, attending the DARPA Robotics Challenge, where you know 24 teams of the best roboticists in, in the world uh, attempted to build machines with millions of dollars of funding and two years of, uh, of work uh, that could do eight simple tasks, uh, driving, opening doors, uh, you know, closing valves. Um, you know, those machines weighed up to 400 pounds. I wouldn't want those machines anywhere near grandma. You have to look at the outtakes and uh, to get a really good idea of where we are. That's ground truth um, on machines moving in unstructured environments. And um, you know, so as not to go on too long, I just want to make one final point about the sort of common belief uh, of, the, uh, of the coming of the singularity in Silicon Valley, which is sort of the unofficial religion of the region where I live. Um, I, I have a piece in the paper this week about all of the sort of aspects of Moore's law that are actually slowing. Uh, and just to mention, too, um, you know, Denard scaling, which Irving, I'm sure you know a great deal about, the increasing clock speed uh, basically stopped a decade ago. And more significantly, two years ago, um, the cost of transistors stopped falling. And so those, those you know, faster, faster, cheaper, cheaper sort of common beliefs in Silicon Valley are not working in our favor anymore. And um, if we're going to get to the singularity in some magical Hegelian way, I, I just don't see how we can get there. And so John, let me ask you a follow-on question, and then I want to ask one to David, and then we'll turn it to the audience. So Jim Clark, uh, after we heard the talk by uh, this really interesting talk by an expert from the UN saying that in Europe and other countries, women are having fewer children because they are working outside the home. He said, well, maybe robots will become nannies and assist with not only older people, but with babies. From your comments, I don't think you would let one of your babies be taken care of by one of the robots you see. Is that a but right? Well, so I'm watching this as carefully as I can. And you know, the things that we're um, reacting to are dramatic improvements in perception, machine perception and falling cost. Uh, machines are speaking, machines are listening. Um, machines aren't doing so well at planning yet. And I, those breakthroughs, if they're going to come, have yet to happen. And so the dirty secret about the DARPA robo robotics challenge is that virtually all of those machines were almost entirely teleoperated. There was very little autonomy that we saw. And the autonomy that was there was extremely low level. And that's really an important, that was ground truth about where we are in unstructured environments right now. And, you know, a baby or an elder is an extremely difficult problem. I've seen work at, at Berkeley, for example, in uh, sort of taking machine learning techniques and imply, applying them uh, to the problems of des dexterous manipulation. And they're making advances, but only the first, uh, you know, very small steps in that direction. And, and David, um, You've written some very interesting articles on what you call Pollyanni's paradox, which maybe you can explain briefly, which I think explain why machines don't do quite as well in planning in these kinds of tasks as humans do. Do you, do you want to comment on that? That was a big part of your article. Sure. Uh, Pollyanni, uh, the, the philosopher of science, uh, Michael Pollyanni, uh, not the economist, his brother, uh, uh, maybe I have that reversed. Well, <laughs> I, uh, he made the point that uh, he, the words he used were, we, we know more than we can tell, uh, meaning there are many, many things that we know how to do be, uh, uh, implicitly, tacitly, but we don't know how to do explicitly. So take the example of uh, doing mathematics versus walking. Uh, I know how to do math, and I know how to teach my kids how to do math because someone taught me how to do math. And the reason they knew how to do math is because math is a formal skill set that we developed consciously as a way of recording and manipulating information. I don't know how to teach my kids how to walk. They come with built-in equipment for walking, and I can give them a little assistance while that equipment you know, comes up to speed. But if I had to explain it to them verbally and tell them the muscle and memory and cognitive motions to do it, I could not do that. And the reason is because walking is a skill that we evolved. It's not one that we developed uh, consciously. And so we don't know the procedure for doing it. And that makes it a challenge for, uh, for programming, for engineering, because things that we fully explicitly understand, it's easy, relatively easy to write a program to do those things, whether it's playing chess 
whether it's doing a large series of calculations, uh, whether it's uh, sorting and filing and operating upon large amounts of information. But when it comes to planning, working, you know, manipulating uh, your body in an uncertain environment, recognizing objects in a visual field, uh, stringing together words to create per per persuasive sentences and develop new arguments, uh, we're trying to reverse engineer those things that we do. We don't know how we do them, and so it's hard for us to make machines that do them. Now, I want to be clear, I think progress is being made. I, I, my observation is similar to John's, that it's very slow and halting, but it may accelerate. But my claim about machines complementing us does not depend upon the idea that they don't make progress. It's the idea that they allow us to do other things with our time that is also valuable. So even if we have lots and lots of great robotics, which I think eventually we will, I don't think humans will be superfluous, but I think we have to manage it correctly. You know, take the case of Saudi Arabia and Norway. Those are two countries that have vast uh, resources due to oil wealth, among other things. Uh, and that's like having, you know, sort of like the robot world. You can have machines to do all your work. Well, you can have oil that creates all this wealth for you. Uh, but they, these two countries handle that uh, bounty very differently. In Saudi Arabia, almost 90% of the private sector workforce is guest workers. And uh, you have a lot of people who are not engaged in meaningful work, and there's a lot of unrest. They're working on that challenge. In Norway, also having vast oil wealth, uh, almost everybody works, but they don't work all that many hours, and they have lots of paid leave, and they have paternity and maternity leave, and they have vacation uh, and health care, and they have taken that bounty that comes from, uh, you know, things that give you wealth, whether that is, you know, automation or whether that's uh, natural resources, and they've used it well to create a functioning, engaged democracy. And so if we really make these great advances, as we, I hope we will, that, all, that create so much bounty, the challenge is to uh, use that gift wisely mm -hmm. to make sure that people, the, a large set of people, stay engaged, have a meaningful role in society, and have uh, you know lives that they feel are productive. And that is certainly feasible. Great. Let me ask the audience here, since we have two truly great experts, if you have any questions. Okay, great. I see that settles two it. Questions oh. in back, so. <laughs> So we'll get there. I don't know if you guys can see us, but there are questions in back for sure. Maria Lorna Kunas from Davis, California. And my question or my comment is, I think there's really no reason for people to be very scared of the new paradigm because what I see happening is actually like, okay, we started with agriculture and then industrialization then information, now automation. We are setting platforms for people to be creative. From agriculture, even agriculture, people are going back to sustainable, sustainable living, farming, which is safer, safer for the environment, more, much cheaper, and also healthier. And then you've got 3D printing, you can manufacture your own uh, automobile parts, dental parts, uh, almost unimaginable, clothes, yep. clothing, and every kind of de de do-it-yourself platform actually pulls out the creative juices from every person, every individual. Yeah, you're making a very good point, which both David and John make yes. often, which is humans have always co-evolved with our tools. And so what you're saying is, as we get more and more of these technologies, the humans will leverage those platforms and do new things. And the, the reason we cannot imagine what those things are is because we don't have the platform. So we probably couldn't have predicted apps like we have today, even 15 years ago, but here come smartphones and we have apps. So it's that co-evolution, I think, that you are mentioning. David, John, do you want to comment on that? Uh, 
David, do you have, do, I mean, I, I, I think that I'm seeing it all around us and it's, you know, sure. the transition from agriculture to industrial society was the, the, the classic example of, of how we can't expect what the model will look like or can't understand what the model, model will look like easily. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I, I fully agree with the point. I mean, I think we have, you know, the challenges that we face in the world today are not challenges of uh, overwhelming abundance, of having too much capability to do our work too easily. They're challenges of scarcity and maldistribution and also misgovernance. And uh, most of the great uh, problems of poverty uh, and need in the world are really due to misgovernance. Uh, they're not due to a lack of technology. In fact, if the technology of the West were uh, available in the rest of the world, in fact, it, it primarily is what is not uh, available nearly as readily as good institutions right. uh, that allow people to take advantage of that. Right. So uh, it's, uh, I'm not, uh, I would, you know, if more of this uh, bounty could be shared, that would be terrific. We don't, we're not particularly good at helping govern countries figure out how to govern themselves, but that would make an enormous difference. Yeah. Um, let me well, also let me, say, okay. uh, let, but let me let me issue one one yeah. concern. So, I although I don't worry much about the impact of automation on the developed world. I think it's it's almost all to the good, not entirely, but almost. I worry a little more about its impact on the developing world, uh, because if they don't, they, taking as a given that you know most of the technology is owned in the West, a lot of the wealth or at least the income flows of the developing world come from supplying either. Uh, you know, uh, labor-intensive activities like uh, like uh, textiles, like leather goods, or providing domestic labor uh, as migrants to the rich world. And it's possible that automation could reduce the demand for those activities, which are effectively a resource of the developing world. So the reason that leather goods and textiles are not heavily automated is they require high levels of dexterity to work with right. irregular and soft materials. If that were to change very quickly, on the one hand, that would be great. Lots of people could make leather goods and textiles much more cheaply. But on the other hand, if that is the sort of comparative advantage of you know, Bangladesh and they don't own the capital, uh, that could actually be uh, a substantial blow to demand for their resources, just like China's slowing demand for commodities uh, is a very, it creates a no. severe challenge for Brazil. Right. Thank you. La and you had one last question. Please. Sure. Hi there. Thanks so much, both of you. Um, so one of the themes that's come up a lot today uh, is the idea that even though there are, um, you know, historically situations where we've been able to uh, substitute, you know, humans into the labor force as new jobs have come around, um, that there is this thought that we're now, um, you know, there's only so many things that humans are good at. And so maybe it's not 10 years, maybe it's not 20 years, maybe it's 30 or 40 years, but I just, I'm curious your, some of your thoughts about, um, you know, are there any reasons why you're optimistic about, uh, you know, substitute jobs apart from the historical fact that, that we've tended to figure it out in the past? John, do you want to start? Well, I, I, I take David on this as being really quite clear. I mean, um, I think that uh, the one thing I would say is we, as a human, seem to have this unlimited ability to amuse e each other. And I think that increasingly that part of the world, you know, humans uh, sort of doing things that are not perhaps economically ne necessary, but uh, occupy us is going to be w where the future of work is. Uh, it, just, it just seems so obvious to me. David? Uh, I, I, I agree. I think John put that well. A lot of work already is that, right? If you think about you know, restaurants, if you think about uh, TV and entertainment, if you think about a lot of the app economies actually driven by entertainment demand, uh, you know, we do a lot of things for the sake of experience, and a lot of the things that we perceive ourselves to need are totally unnecessary <laughs> from any, uh, you know, survivalist uh, standpoint. So uh, I do think we create demand for one another. But again, jobs, you know, in general, economists uh, would not want to say jobs are a good per se. Uh, jobs are a way of creating income. If we can create income without jobs, then we just need a different form of income distribution, right? Our sense, our primary means of in income distribution at present is based on labor scarcity. You can do a set of things that are valuable to the market. You've gone to school, you've learned them. You do them for 30 or 35 years. You save a bunch of money, you retire. 
and uh, and so your labor is scarce. If really all those things that you can do could be done by machines at you know uh, pennies on the dollar, then you wouldn't be able to command a high standard of living based on your labor. However, if that were true, if really all those things could be done, then we would still have the ability to create that wealth. We would just have to find a different means to distribute it. I don't think that's going to be the case, but when we talk about this jobless future, that is a crisis of abundance. In general, abundance is not a bad problem to have. And David, if I may close this by bringing up a point that one of the other articles in the same issue as yours uh, mentioned, which is if you look at the costs of media and entertainment, how they have fallen over the last 50 years, we haven't paid much attention to it, but it's phenomenal. I mean, today the internet gets us access to all kinds of things. You can buy a, a superb flat panel television for incredibly small amounts of money. We have huge content. And so if we're going to have more and more leisure in our lives, we won't spend it by sitting in the dark like people may have had to do in the industrial age. We are in social media. We are reading John's articles. We are reading David's articles. You know, there is a lot more learning that's truly taking place and a lot more high class entertainment. So that may not be a GDP oriented activity, but it's probably one that has a huge impact in quality of life. And with that, hopefully it's more optimistic statement. Let me thank John and David for so kindly making time to appear here. And thank you very much. Thank you for inviting us. Thank you.